professional that is occupying my thoughts today is Tom Reese. So imagine uh, an opportunity would come up to further connect with that professional by owning a few that he actually owned and used himself. I'm going to show you that later on in this presentation, this program. Welcome to Cues and Views, first on the web for collecting English billiard cues. Hello, welcome to the latest in our series of films relating to billiards and snooker memorabilia collecting. As you know from past experience of watching our films and productions and whatever, my main interest is collecting vintage and antique billiards and snooker cues. However, along the way, certain pieces of additional memorabilia come to light and become available, and it's an incredibly interesting thing to try and get hold of uh, these additional items that put us in contact with the history of the game and famous players of, of the past, really. Uh, some of these players are, are, are long dead, and uh, you know they only live in the memory of record books and perhaps some grainy old film that shows you the way they played, the way they behaved, the way they moved and, and everything. So sometimes we, we get a hint of getting closer to having an understanding of these players with such cues as facsimile cues. Now fi facsimile cues are, to all intents and purposes, uh, a manufactured cue that is very similar to the cue used by a given professional. Um, the professional that is occupying my thoughts today is Tom Reese. Tom Reese among cue collectors is famous for a break of 499-135 that was made by him in 1907. This break was so significant that, uh, along with another break that's large but uh, nowhere near as large as, as that break, forced the governing body to change the rules to outlaw the, uh, the stroke that was involved. I'm not going to say too much about that stroke that was involved because I'm actually going to show you some footage in a short while and you'll actually see Tom Reese himself playing several of the shots. Not five and a half weeks worth, but certainly a few shots to give you a feeling of what the shot was like. And this shot, this stroke, that was the bulk of that break was the, the so-called Ankh Cannon, uh, where the, the uh, two scoring balls and the object ball kept very close to a corner pocket, so close that very little movement was involved. Uh, and this break was in a match uh, up to 500,000 points and four 99135, as you can see, was the vast bulk of that scoring uh, contribution by Mr. Reese. Um, so, that break was such a milestone that you see it on the badges of cues, Tom Reese cues, several Tom Reese cues, some Burroughs and Watts cues, uh, and some Peridon cues that, that uh, include that break gets mentioned. So imagine an, an opportunity would come up to further connect with that professional by owning a cue that he actually owned and used himself. Well, a friend of mine got that opportunity and uh, took advantage of that opportunity and has that cue, owns that cue. And I'm going to show you that cue later on in this presentation this program. But at the same time, I was given the opportunity to own Tom Reese's practice balls, practice billiard balls, crystallite balls, and his leather container or pouch, if you want to call it that. It's a case, really, for, for transporting the balls, keeping the balls in good order, and whatever. Now, I've got that. I'm just going to show you a picture of it. Now, as you can see, crudely engraved on the lid, if you like, of this case 
is T threes. Now, you might be thinking, well, anybody could do that with a rusty nail or whatever. But it is my belief that Tom Reese himself, or a friend of his, on his behalf, engraved that on there. Yes, crudely, I admit that. Without hesitation, I admit that. Um, but they came with the cue, uh, and another cue that came with it, uh, in, the, in the same case and the case as well, which is one of those full-length leather cases. Now, this set of balls here, uh, owned currently by me, given to me by the previous owner, I will show you a little bit more. They are in good order, they're nice, clean, shiny. Um, it looks a bit pale on your screen, I admit that, but they are crystallate and it is fully sort of red and the billiard ball has its spots and all that kind of thing. And I do believe that these certainly would be not used in the uh, in the famous break that I've mentioned. They're much later than that. But I do believe that they would be owned by Tom Reese. And uh, as I said, they're currently owned by myself. So, it's nice to see these things, to have these things, to, to preserve these things and, and uh, <laughs> watch what we're all about on the table even. Uh, and to commemorate such a player who had such a significant place in, uh, in the history of the game. And perhaps got people interested uh, in, in huge billiard breaks, paved the way um, for people like uh, Lindrum and uh, even Joe Davis with his famous snooker breaks in, in later years. So, you know, got the public interested. It would be in the newspapers of the day and what have you. Pathé later made a film. And they call it an interview. Now, there's no sound. But they call it an interview with Tom Reese. And they put a film together where Tom Reese shows the way he struck, struck the ball and whatever. Now you'll notice in, in the film, when I show it you in a minute, in fact I'll, I'll show it you now, I'll, I'll uh, just move over to that. This caption giving us an idea of um, the style of the time, really, the, the lettering that's used and, and what have you. And this, this is a commemorative film that shows Tom Reese in action. It talks about his record. When I say it talks, there we are. Captions appear that talk about um, his record and his achievements as a professional player. So that even this 21 years later, it was still being talked about, this, this feat. And there he is. There's the man himself. And here he is showing his cueing stroke. Now you'll notice that the boat the cue is completely black buttered now. Whether that's because he's holding the badge inwards or what, I'm not 100% sure. I know this is quite dark, but you can see that he's playing several shots on the billiard table. And this print has been saved. Thank goodness it's been saved. It's the only footage I know that has ever been preserved of Tom Reese in play. And it shows the competence and you know, these, these old billiard players, they, they always surprise me that, you know, they, they get on with the game, they're quick, they know the shots, they, they play the shots with great confidence and skill. And um, they're quite interesting to watch with the mannerisms and so on. And it, this video also hints at that Tom Reese made other big breaks, a thousand plus breaks when the rules were changed. and. The famous scoring stroke was um, was banned, and you can see again he knows what he's doing. You know, he certainly is a capable billiards player. And um, again, it's even possible, I suppose, that the billiard balls that are used in this film, which is 1928, by 1925 they'd stopped using ivories in the championship. So. Crystal Lake balls and they do look nice and shiny. I'm not saying they are the same set, but it's possible that they are. 
the very set that you've seen earlier, um, is equally more likely that they're not, but it's not impossible. So again, if they are, it puts you in contact with the history. Um, direct physical contact in my case, and I'm showing you these so that you've got an idea of what they're like. And you can see the way he holds the cue. It's all very, very delicate. He, in fact, wrote a book called Dainty Billiards. And he was famous for his delicacy of stroke. So there you go. That's Tom Reese in action. Playing several other shots that made him famous. That he used to make them monumentally massive break, 499135. Um, possibly use these practice balls that we have here for hours upon hours, even towards the latter end of his career. And he was uh, famous for this big break and well known throughout his career. So he was born in 1873, died in 1953. The break itself took five weeks to compile, which Someone said in, in jest, I saw this mentioned online, uh, pity the referee, but yeah, uh, an incredible feat. The gentleman that he played was a guy called Joe Chapman when he made that break. Some people think he played against Melbourne Inman and made that break, uh, but no, he didn't. Uh, he played against Joe Chapman. Some of the cues that bear his name, as I said before, are uh, from Burroughs and Watts. Um, which was formed in 1836. Some of the cues are Peregrine cues. Peregrine were formed in 1885. But of course, the, both companies have been going a long time before they started producing Tom Reese cues. Um, the facsimile cue was at the, or career record cue, which is the later uh, Tom Reese cue. I believe it's obvious that they were made by Peregrine. And um, they're different to the Brothers and Watts. The design is different. The, the facing splice is different. You could see, um, probably insert some pictures into this uh, presentation um, afterwards so that you can see the cues. They, they are different. And you, you, you can spot the difference immediately as soon as you see it. You will, you will see the difference. So he was a great break maker. He was um, famous for the break. And um, some of the artifacts have survived to the day, to, to today, and, and are with us today. As I said earlier, I'm going to give you a quick glance over some of the Tom Reese cues that were available throughout, you know, the past, let's say, 90 years collecting wise r roughly from 1907 onwards basically now at the first um, the, the earliest uh, Tom Reese cue that I know of um, or that springs to mind at the moment I might have a rethink uh, at another point but the earliest one I know of is is the one made by Burroughs and Watts which must have been made between 1907 and 1913 um, there are three major uh, cues bearing uh, Tom Reese's break from Burroughs and Watts. Uh, the 1913, 1916 uh, and the 1907. Now admittedly there are variations whether it be a plastic badge or, or an ivory badge or a, an ivory badge. I'm not going to go into such detail. We're, we're not really focusing on that side of things today. I'm giving you a quick glance at the cues that bear Tom Reese's name so that when you see the cue that it is believed was his at the latter end of his career. And now you saw the video earlier that was made in 1928. If you look at one of the cues that I'm going to show you in a minute, it mentions 1927. And the fact that um, by then he had made six breaks over a thousand. Now, when you compare 499135 with breaks just over a thousand, it, 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 to people who don't know billiards very well, it may seem there's a world of difference between half a million and a thousand. But if the, if you understand that the rules have been made more challenging, certainly for Reese, who was a uh, 
specialist at the, at the close cannons, uh, you can understand that making a thousand break with the more open rules and the more varied rules is going to be a big challenge. So, therefore, the six breaks over a thousand in, in the post-1907 career that he had are quite significant. Also bearing in mind that up until 1925, in professional play, they would be using the ivory billiard balls. And again, that makes his breaks significant. And therefore, they've been recorded on cues uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the years. So the first ones I'm going to show you are my own 1907 Tom Reese cue, made by Brothers and Watts. Now, you can see that this is an ivory badge because, if nothing else, the cracks and the fact that the corner's missing. But also the letters are sepia-brown sort of colour. So that demonstrates that it's an ivory badge, uh, for one thing. Um, Fouillet Burr facing splice, hand splice cue. Uh, that cue I've had for a long number of years, um, and expect to have it for a long number of years more. This is my 1906. Uh, excuse me, this is my 1916 um, Reese cue. Um, again, this cue is in far better condition, lovely, lovely condition. Um, I'm very pleased to have it. Again, for your both face and splice, hand splice again. Um, those two cues, um, if I can get the other, other variations, I will do. Um, it's not something I've been overly chasing. I wanted these two variations, I enjoyed these. These here, one belongs to a friend of mine and is in absolutely immaculate condition, almost unbeatable condition, and my own, which is the one on the right, which is nearly as good, I, I will say, and uh, in good order. Mahogany facing splice. And as I've said before, these are paradigm cues. And as I've said before, the uh, six breaks over a thousand get mentioned. That gives you more of an indication of the uh, the condition. I believe that's my friend's cue, not mine. I think they are nice. Now this picture is significant because it shows you the book lengths. It shows you the face in splices. Now this is going to become significant when you see the cue that we believe belonged. Tom Rees, uh, because I'm going to show you that shortly, and you'll see that the design is quite similar, but the book length is longer now than these. Now I've compared these, I've had them side by side, I've had a really good look. Yeah, the timber looks of a similar vintage, although the timber in the Rees queue looks older, uh, his own queue looks older, uh, but they are of a, a, a similar general design. Now, as we've said before about facsimile queues, and these, to me, even though it doesn't say facsimile, are sort of a facsimile cue because they are based on the cue that he was using at the time. Now, the, the Pathé video was 1928. These cues must have been available around that time. So clearly he was using a cue when these were made that had a facing splice, I think. But because it doesn't say facing splice, this is open for debate, and this is a theory, so I'm not, I'm not going to hold to this until I get definite evidence, but it strongly suggests, history suggests that the cue that he was using was like these in 1927. And the cue that I'm going to show you shortly is kind of like these, pretty much like these. So there we are, Those are, that's a quick, oops, that's a quick canter through the uh, the Tom Reese cues that I own and a friend of mine owns. There are others. Uh, if you're going to get into collecting Tom Reese cues, there are some others to be had. Uh, but as far as I know, there's only one that claims to be the cue used by Tom Reese himself. And shortly, I'm going to show you that cue. I'll move over to the queue and show you the queue in some detail and the case. Um, this queue and case 
um, and you can see that the badge is ill-fitting. It's small, but it is a very unusual badge with the brake uh, written sideways on, um, as opposed to, um, you know, portrait style. So, again, did Tom Rees just have this badge loosely fitted because he liked the badge and possibly on those later Tom Rees cues, was there a choice, essentially, between using this style of badge uh, or the other style of badges with the six brakes over a thousand. It's hard to know, uh, but that badge is uh, definitely unusual, uncommon. I have seen one other on a queue um, in all my years. Now, this shows you the length of the splicers. Did you notice how long they are? Now, there are reports that Reese's queue was altered. There was damage. It was given to him by John Roberts, and there was damage, and therefore the queue was extended. Uh, and look at the ageing on the case. I mean, that is by no means a pristine case. It's travelled all around uh, and it's got many years on it. So again, that's in keeping with what we might expect of a professional skew of that era. Um, so yeah, make your own mind up. Be the judge yourself. I can't be 100% certain that this skew was Tom Reese's. However, um, there's a lot of evidence that supports the idea that it may well have been.